Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Yes. I, we're in a new quarterly this um, starting today, and it's called Rest in Christ. And this is something that we all need desperately is rest in Christ. So we're really going to jump into this today. But before we do, um, Scott, would you pray for us? Sure. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we're all living in difficult, stressful times where we especially need the rest that you would provide, uh, both in terms of the Sabbath and just resting in terms of knowing that we're secure and we can be at peace in the midst of the storms that are going on about us. So we ask you that you bless us, that you send the Holy Spirit to anoint our lips so we may speak your words and not ours. In your name we pray, amen. 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 So our memory text is today comes to us from Psalms 84:2. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And we all do that. We all cry out for God because he is the only place we have rest. <clears throat> this last year has been filled with fear and stress. We've dealt with a pandemic that has just been fraught with fear. We've watched loved ones pass. We've had lockdowns. We've seen more violence this year than in the past. And uh, even in Los Angeles, in February of this year, murder rate was up 200%. So even in our own community, in our own area, we've seen an increase in violence. We're facing inflation political upheaval, and the great global reset beginning about, brings about unsurety and insecurities for our future. We're forced with stressful choices in our lives and in our families. Restlessness and fear go hand in hand. Living in a world <clears throat> that keeps most people busy 24 hours a day, seven days a week can result in a restless and fearfulness in our lives. Who doesn't at times struggle with fear, with worry, with dread of what the future holds? The past is done, the present is now, but the future remains full of questions. And the, in this unstable world, the answers might not be what we want to hear. We wonder if we will be able to make a looming deadline, cover the next month's rent, or our school payment. We struggle to make our marriages survive another storm. Sometimes we even <clears throat> worry if God can continue to love us even though we disappoint him again and again. There's so many aspects of life that we look at that bring us worry and stress. So this quarter we're going to tackle some of those fears head on. Rest, rest in Christ is not just the title for a study guide or a captivating logo for an evangelistic campaign or camp meeting. Resting in Christ is the key to the promise of the type of life that Jesus promises his followers. John 10.10 10 says, The thief doesn't come to except to steal, to kill, and destroy. Christ says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Rest connects to salvation, to grace, to creation, to the Sabbath, to our understanding of the state of of the dead, to the soon coming of Jesus, and to so much more. When Jesus invited us to come and rest with him, as we see in Matthew 11:28, where he says, Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He addressed not only his disciples or the early Christian church. He saw future generations of sick, and sick worry-worn, struggling humans, beings who need access to the source of rest. As you study the weekly lesson during the quarter, remember to come and rest with Jesus. After all, our Heavenly Father is in control and is already to bring us home to him safely. Our society filled with restlessness combined with uncertainty of the future contribute to the restlessness of the soul. This growing concern among mental health professionals with increasing numbers of distressed people 
<clears throat> are being treated. It's estimated that more than 300 million depressed people in the world and that depression will surpass heart disease as the leading cause of death in the next few decades. Worldwide sales of antidepressants are now expected to be more than $6 billion, according to Thompson and Reuters Pharma projections, based on consensus forecasts and analysts. More than 270 million prescriptions of antidepressants are sold in the United States each year. And that doesn't include those who are self-medicating that don't take prescriptions. We see an uptick in, in alcohol, in suicides, in and illicit drugs where people are self-medicating to help deal with that restlessness of their spirit. So our lesson this quarter, and especially this week's lesson, focus on the source of rest provided, provides practical counsel on how to rest in the busyness of our lives. There's several words that the Bible uses for rest, and we're going to see many more than the four I'm going to share with you. But first of all, there is katapasis, which is like the word noah, which means rest and comfort. Um, we see in Hebrew, Hebrews 4.1, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have short of, come short of it. There's anapasis, means rest from weariness. Come to me, all ye labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, as it says in Matthew 11, 28. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 7 uses anesis, or relaxation, which means, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And then the one that we are all familiar with is the sabbatismos, or the Sabbath rest where um, we see that rest like that of God when he had finished the work of creation. There remains, therefore, a rest for God's people. So this week, we'll travel back to the time of creation of our world and discover eternal reminder of rest in Christ, the Sabbath. We'll study Old Testament scribes' deep grief and impact on physical, mental, and emotional health. Throughout this week's lesson, we will continually be consistently reminded of Christ's invitation to rest throughout the scriptures. As we learn the meaning of the word rest in the Old and New Testament, we will understand Cain's restlessness more fully and discover how to rest totally in Christ. So Scott, <clears throat> would you like to talk to us today about being worn and weary? Well, Barbara, the worn and weary, that, that certainly seems to describe a good portion of the world these days. So, um, and most but, of us. <laughs> and, and us, too. <laughs> I, I guess it's appropriate for, for us being worn and weary at the um, end of a day and so forth. So, um, but let's, let's see what the scriptures have to say. And uh, this was a particularly good Sabbath school lesson because I think this is very apropos to things that are going on. So um, I was actually going to read here that Genesis, wh why would God create a rest day before anyone was even tired? So let's refer to Genesis 2, 1 through 3. And so the heavens were, and the earth were completed, and all their heavenly lights. By the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because on it he rested from all his work that he had created and made. Um, and I kind of liked what the Sabbath school lesson had to say, so I'm going to quote it here. So even before we humans dash off on our self-imposed stressful lives, God established a marker, a living way to jog our memory. This day would be a time to stop and deliberately enjoy life, a day, to be, um, a day to be and not to do, a day to especially celebrate the gift of grass, air, wildlife, water, people, and most of all, the creator of every good gift. And, and I think I'm going to just stop and pause and analyze that statement a little bit, which basically says, 
It's a day for us to, to rest in God, to recreate uh, our, our tired um, spirits. So to, to enjoy the outdoors, to enjoy each other, to enjoy um, the Creator who, who's given us all these good gifts. This was no one-time invitation that expired with the exile from Eden. God wanted to make sure that this invitation would stand the test of time, and so right from the beginning, he knit the Sabbath rest into the very fabric of time. There would always be the invitation again and again to a restful celebration of creation every seventh day. One would think that with all our labor-saving devices, we should be less physically tired than people were 200 years ago. But actually, it seems rest is in short supply even today. Even the moments when we aren't working are spent in frantic activity. It always seems that we are somehow behind. No matter how much we manage to get done, there's always more to do. Research shows, too, that we are getting less sleep and many people are highly, highly dependent on caffeine to keep going. Though we have faster cell phones, faster computers, faster internet connections, we still never seem to have enough time. And interestingly, the one thing we all have the same amount of is time. So you can make more money, but you can't make more time. So uh, time is one of our most valuable commodities. And yet God knew that without his um, Sabbath rest that he's given us as a gift, we would continue to work ourselves to death. And some people are indeed doing that. And um, I think on Wednesday we'll get to this, but it seems like the rest of the world is starting to recognize too that we need a, a day of rest, uh, a, a time to take apart from, uh, from the busyness and, and it seems like all of our labor-saving devices, as, as mentioned in here, are, are sometimes having the opposite effect. The, that is the effect of um, making us more busy, more tired, and have less time uh, with all of our technology that we have. So uh, next I wanted to kind of go through the texts that are mentioned here, because I think these are amazingly wonderful texts. So we'll, we'll, what do the following texts teach? about why our having rest is important. So at Mark 6.31 it says, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. For there were many people coming and, doing, and going, and they, did, they didn't even have enough time to eat. And that was from the New American Standard Bible. The next text was um, Psalm 4.8. Uh, in peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, have <coughs> me dwell in safety. And I think that, that verse is apropos to our times as well, because I think a lot of people are not sleeping well, they're not resting well, they're becoming depressed, suicidal. Some of them are actually committing suicide. Um, so we really need that. But David knew what he was talking about for... Uh, I think it would have been difficult to rest for David when he was being chased by Saul who wanted to kill him, uh, or for that matter by numerous other enemies like the Philistines. Um, so let's see, and, and then the next verse is Exodus 23:12. For in six days you are to do your work, but on the seventh day you shall cease from your labor that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female slave, as well as the stranger residing with you, may refresh themselves. So it seems that God even cares about uh, animals and slaves and so forth, that, that he, he worries for them to have a day of rest too. Um, and then the, the same commandment is repeated in Deuteronomy 5.14, but this one kind of adds another component of the stranger that's in your house. It says, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, and you shall not do any work on that day, you or your son or daughter or your male slave or your female slave or your ox or donkey or any of your cattle or the resident who stays with you. I think the 
King James Version said, the stranger residing in your house, so that your male slave and your female slave may rest, for, uh, may rest as well as you. So it seems like God was even thinking of uh, everyone, including guests, slaves, animals, and so forth. Um, and then the last text is Matthew 11:28, which says, Come to me, all who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Uh, the God who created us knew that we needed physical rest. He built cycles into time, night and Sabbath, to offer us a chance for physical rest. Acknowledging Jesus as the Lord of our lives also involves taking seriously our responsibility to make time to rest. After all, the Sabbath commandment isn't merely suggestion. It's a commandment. So, um, I think what we'll explore more on the, on the Wednesday lesson, because I think they're, they're going over some of these verses, is the way in which the world is now recognizing that we need rest, but we're going to contrast how the world will approach needing rest versus how we, based on the Bible, Christians can approach this, uh, the story of rest. Uh, and I'll leave you with one last thing. So there's a gentleman by the name of Matt Walker, who wrote a book called Why We Sleep, mm -hmm. uh, and which is, I think is an excellent book, but he gives multiple reasons of why we need sleep. But I would include along with sleep, so the nightly rest, also the Sabbath rest. So he, some of the benefits of sleep are that it improves your mood, it makes your memory better, uh, it allows you to be more efficient in your work, um, it um, helps your, your physical health, it improves your immune s system. So I would say the Sabbath does all of the same things, and so we need nightly rest as well as Sabbath rest. So I'll, I'll leave us with that, and then we'll move to the next day. Thank you. And Danielle, let's move on to Monday, Running on Empty. Money, Monday. Money. <laughs> Monday, running on empty. It almost sounds like a little song, running on empty, that we can uh, sing today. It will become very popular because everybody feels that way. And what is the lesson referring to? It's referring about burnout. That's another term that we use very commonly in our day to day today society, and everybody seems to understand it. It's uh, when you are emotionally burned out work burned out, when you are going on full throttle, trying to cover so many areas, and sort of along the line of what Scott was saying, all the devices that uh, have come into our time uh, are just multiplying our work. They're making us efficient, but also adding to work. But when we're running, looking at running on empty, we uh, can evaluate it from our perspectives of busy lives, of taking care of children, taking care of households and work, and the demands that are left and right, even the demands of um, activities at church. So, you know, we, it's easy for us to kind of evaluate that. But when we're looking at the Bible, we also see that there were a lot of examples of burnout in the Bible. So I pulled a couple of examples. We have in the lesson Baruch, and we'll review him last, but we have other examples. Before I go into those texts, I just want to give us a text from Matthew 11, 28, 30, because God has made provision for us, all of those with burnout. Um, and this text highlights that. Come to me, it says, all you who labor and are heavy laden. God understood. He understands us to that level and not only understand us, but he made provisions for those that are laboring and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Rest is a very wide word. We'll be studying a quarter about it and it, for a good reason because it has so many aspects to it. Uh, like we were just highlighting a couple of them. And it's, he, then he continues, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we see that there's our God 
not only understands us, loves us, made provisions for us. But let's look at some of the examples of leaders in the Bible that have been burned out. And the first one that I thought of as I was preparing for this lesson was Moses. So we're looking at Numbers chapter 11, verse 11. And it says, So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant, and why have I not found favor in your sight, that you have laden the burden of all these people on me? I mean, there were how many millions? I don't remember exactly, but there were so many, and they, he had a lot to deal with. And we remember even some of the details of how he was doing so many aspects of taking care of them, including judging for all their little uh, misunderstandings between themselves to the point where they finally came to him and said, we, you can't go on like this. We've got to make some arrangements. So we see Moses. Another one that came to mind immediately was Elijah. And we know that Elijah was hiding, in hiding for a while. Probably that was relaxing time while he was in hiding. <laughs> but once he came out of hiding, he had a major job to do. And the major job was to confront on God's behalf and to, through God's power and God's help, uh, Baal and the whole country that was worshiping Baal. And he did those, that successfully. God had given him a job, and he was very successful. You sh you'd think that he would be very relieved after that. But instead, what happened is Jezebel threatened him with his life for the achievement he, that he had done, and he ran for his life. And here it is in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 3 to 4, and says, And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. He was so distraught and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. So we can see his condition beyond burnout, wants to die. Then David, Psalm 61, 2. From the end of the earth I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. And that's the key text that I wanted to highlight in there. He is, his heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Like, take me out. And when I'm reading this, when I was reading this text, there's another thought that came to me as I was preparing for this lesson. As we are in the whirlwind of problems and issues, we can't see the trees from the forest. In a way, that's what rest provides. It lifts you up on a higher than I spot so that you can see over the horizon what it is that's important. And God knew that. He made that provision. The disciples, you just read the text where they didn't even have time to, to eat because people were coming and going. So I won't read that text again. And then we get to the story of Baruch. Now, Baruch, I must say, I've read the Bible several times, but he doesn't come first to mind. So when the lesson was highlighting, I had to do a little digging on him. He was a scribe. He was an educated man. He was uh, Jeremiah's secretary, so to speak. And when we're looking at the book of Jeremiah, uh, while it was dictated by Jeremiah, it was written by Baruch. He, he, um, and he was Jeremiah, the prophet's uh, right-hand man, so to speak. Everywhere he went, he did. And they were so close together and working so mm, intently together and dedicated to each other. And he was so dedicated to the work that he even went when... Um, uh, when Zedekiah and Jeremiah were sent to Egypt, uh, like exiled, he went along with Jeremiah uh, and accompanied there. Ever loyal, he was very loyal. But we see this text, and what the text is telling us is he's doing this amazing work, uh, but he's in a timeline when uh, there's a lot of warning of the punishment that God is going to inflict to wake up uh, his people. And as they're bringing this message to the people, there is a lot of stress, concern, and eventually burnout. And here we go in Jeremiah 45, 1 to 5, it says, the word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in a book at the instruction of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, so Baruch was writing these words in the book on Jeremiah's behalf, and he, he's being distraught, 
and Jeremiah saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch. You said, so Baruch said, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sight, and I find no rest. He is so distraught over the message that he's bringing to the people that he is just, Woe, woe is me. And the response to him is, Thus you shall say to him, So Jeremiah is instructed to tell Baruch, Thus says the Lord, quote, Behold what I have built, in other words, the Israelite nation, I will break down, and what I have planted, I will pluck up. That is this whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. Like if you're thinking of building a future in this country, do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. And then is the message to Baruch. But I will give your life to you as a prize in all places wherever you go. So it's an assurance of care for him to relieve him of that distress. But it's also a little something in this text. It says, a surprise in all the places wherever you're going to go. So it's almost like a sign that he's going to be banished. So he is not assured that he's going to live lavishly, but rather that God will provide for him. So there is only one answer for us on this day on running on empty. And I um, want to re-highlight the first text I, I opened with when the Lord says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Thank you. <clears throat> and we're going to jump to Tuesday's lesson now, which is defining rest in the Old Testament. So we talked about a few definitions. I talked about a few de definitions in my opening, and we're going to go through several more uh, in today's lesson. And... Uh, um, as rest, defining rest in the Old Testament. Scott read Genesis 2, <clears throat> 1 to 3, but we're going to look at 2 and 3 again because God said, and the seventh day ended his work, which he had done. So God spent, God's doing this as an example for us. He spent six days working, six days creating the world, six days creating man and all the animals and, and everything that's on heaven and earth. And it said, and he rested the seventh day from the work which he had done. So he did this as an example for us. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. So he blessed it, he sanctified it, he made us a, spe a special day. So he intends it to be a special day, not just for him, but for us as well. And he did this because he rested from the work that he had done. So when we look at the verb Shabbat, it means to seek, to cease work, to rest, and to take a, almost a holiday or a holy day, which is the form of the verb noun, Sabbath. We see this used, the same verb used again in Exodus 5.5 5, when Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are many, and you make them rest from their labor. So Moses, when Moses went to Pharaoh to have them leave Egypt, he told them the reason they wanted to go is so that they could keep their Sabbaths and rest. And Pharaoh was shocked by this. So we see that what Moses is asking Pharaoh is to basically, it is basically causative. And he wants them to, he wants to be able to make them rest and to, to stop them from working. So, and this, of course, we know as, as we read the story, made Pharaoh angry. And, um, and so um, we know the rest of the story. He, he, didn't, he didn't quite follow what Moses was asking until God put them through many more trials. So the reference to God's resting activity on the Sabbath in the fourth commandment is expressed by the Hebrew verb nauk, which is a primitive root. It means to rest or settle down according to Strong's Concordance. And we see this in Exodus 20:11. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed it and hallowed it. We've seen the same in Genesis, 
We hear it, see it repeated in Exodus. Also in Deuteronomy 5.14, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your ox, nor your donkey, nor your cattle, nor your stranger which is in your gates, that you may, your male servant or your female servant may rest as well. So God truly intends us to not work nor cause someone else to work. In fact, our goal, like Moses, is to cause ourselves, our family, and those we come in contact with to rest as well. In Job 3.13, we see, For now I have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep, then I would have been at rest. So we see more figuratively here is that is it used as being settled. And we see this is in a reference to the Ark of the Covenant in Numbers 10.36. And when it rested, the Ark, he said, Returned, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. And so we see this concept of, of settling in, of, of, of this rest. 2 Kings 2.15, Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests this, on Elisha. Now we know that basically that brings upon Elisha the same attributes that Elijah had. That's the same abilities, that same strength that same, same courage that Elijah had because Elisha asked for a double portion of what Elijah had. And so we see this resting upon it means being put upon him, those, those same qualities and attributes. Another important verb form is uh, shakat. Not sure I'm saying that right, shakat. To be at rest, grant relief, or to be quiet. And so this, this relief or quietness we see in Joshua 11.23. So Joshua took the whole land according to the Lord had said to Moses, and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions of their tribes, and the land rested from war. So we see that this rest also brings about a peace. So we're seeing many things here. We're seeing that that this, this rest is to, to cease from working, that it takes upon the, 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 the person resting these, these attributes. And we see that even the whole land then become, begins resting from the war that it's in. And so we see that that, that can happen in our lives. I, I can just start seeing that, that peace, that, that resting from the war that's going on around us in life. And so the term often appears to indicate peace in the book of Joshua and Judges. The verb raga, another one, is also used to indicate rest. In the warnings against disobedience in Deuteronomy, God tells Israel that they won't find rest in exile. And among those nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place. But the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and an anguish of soul. That almost sounds like torment, doesn't it? This not being able to rest, it brings torment to us. The same verb also appears in a causative form in Jeremiah 50, 34. Their Redeemer is strong, the Lord of hosts is his name. He will thoroughly plead their case, that he may rest to the land, to disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. And so this, this inability to rest comes across when God's peace and his rest isn't there. In Deuteronomy 31, 16, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreign lands, where they go to be among them, and they will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. And then Second Samuel 7.12 says, When your days are fulfilled and your rest with your fathers, 
I will set up your seed after you, and you will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. So we look at this resting with our fathers, and we see this many, many, many times in the Bible, especially if you read about the, the kings, and they rested with their fathers, and you see that with King David and, and, and all of the kings. They, they rest in the valley of the kings or with their fathers. So this verse basically talks about laying down in sleep. Or, the, or death. So this is a, a deep rest that they call sleep. In God's covenant with David, God promises future kings of Israel that when your days are fulfilled, you'll rest. And so the long, this long but incomplete list of different Hebrew words denoting rest helps us understand that the theological concept of rest is not connected to one or two particular words. We rest individually and collectively. Rest affects us physically, socially, and emotionally, and is not limited to the Sabbath alone. Death is certainly an enemy, and one day will be abolished. And however much we mourn and miss our dead, it's comforting to know, at least for now, they're at rest. So Scott, you're going to share with us rest in the New Testament. All right. So, um, in the Old Testament, people used to rest on the Sabbath, which is on Saturday. But in the New Testament, people rest on the Christian Sabbath, which is Sunday. So, I, I just thought I would examine the thoughts behind the Lord's Day Alliance. Because I feel like they start off well, and then they, they go off track. So, we're going to examine that part. So, um, Sabbath is an imperative of rest, the recovery of a lost focus, a corrective to our worship practices, the need for more vital corporate life. So some of the benefits of keeping the Sabbath are fellowship uh, time with the family, both the physical and the spiritual family, time to rest from labor, um, that is a day off from the daily grind, time to appreciate nature, Besides being good for the soul, this is also good for the environment. Time to worship God and both corporately and private, privately. So here's a quote from the Lord's Day Alliance. The basis of the American Sabbath union is divine authority and universal and perpetual obligation of the Sabbath as manifested in the order and construction of nature declared by the revealed will of God formulated in the fourth commandment of the moral law interpreted and applied by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then transferred to the Christian Sabbath, that is the Lord's Day, by Christ and his apostles, and approved by the benefit and influence upon his personal and rational life. So the, the part that I was going to say here is that it seems like they start off well, the Lord's Day Alliance, and so they, they, they point out some important benefits of the Sabbath rest. But then they, they switch it to Sunday, which I was going to look at that issue from the Bible. So th th they're basically basing it on 1 Corinthians 16, 1-2. Now concerning the collection of the saints as I directed the Church of Galatia, so you are to do as well. On the first day of the week, each of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections need when, I'm, when I come. So Paul's basically saying here that Instead of collecting offerings on the Sabbath day, people should collect them during the week. But what do they take that to mean? They take that to mean that you should worship on Sunday. Um, but we're going to look at what did Jesus really say about the law. Did he and his apostles change the Sabbath? Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men to do so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so had Christ wished to have people worship him, on the day of his resurrection, he could easily have been resurrected on Sabbath morning because he was done with his work of redemption. Thus, by his resting in the tomb on the Sabbath, he was reaffirming rather than changing the Sabbath. 
Uh, and let's look also at Luke 2356, um, which says, And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So even in his death, uh, Christ was resting. And then let's look at what Christ adds and how he repeats and amplifies his teaching from the Sermon of the Mount when he speaks to John in the book of Revelation. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that saith, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth these words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and the things which are written in this book. So in this way, Christ is repeating the same teaching that he gave on the Sermon on the Mount, but uh, adding that anyone who changes his law will be left outside with the wicked. Um, so then I also wanted to uh, do a quote from the, um, the Great Controversy, which basically says, the wide diversity in belief in the Protestant churches is regarded by many as decisive proof that no effort to secure a forced unity can ever be made. But there has been for years in the churches of the Protestant faith a strong sentiment in favor of a union based upon common points of doctrine. To secure such a union, the discussion of subjects upon which uh, all were not agreed, however important they might be from a Bible standpoint, must necessarily be waived. Charles Beecher, in a sermon in 1846, declared that the ministry of the evangelical Protestant denomination is not, uh, not only formed all the way up under a tremendous pressure of merely human fear, but they live and move and breathe in a state that is radically corrupt and appealing to every hour to the baser element of their nature to hush up the truth and bow the knee to the power of apostasy. Was this not the way things went with Rome? Are we not living her life over again? And what we do and see just ahead. Another general council, a world's convention, an evangelical alliance, a universal creed, a sermon on uh, the Bible, a sufficient creed delivered at Fort Wayne, Indiana, February 22, 1846. When this shall be gained in the effort to secure complete uniformity, it will be only a step to resort to force. So I think the part that um, brought this to mind was the fact that there's been, during this pandemic, essentially a loss of our liberties to where we must all do things for the common good. And I think um, Satan recognizes that if one delusion no longer works, he needs to try a slightly more subtle one. So in this one, I think uh, the world in general is going to recognize the need for a day of rest. But the question is, will they recognize the importance of following God's word? So I think even when we rest, we need to do so according to God's commandment rather than according to um, what we think is correct or what's expedient. So, and, and God is very particular about um, his thing. So I was going to reiterate some of the verses that we had read in a previous lesson about the Sabbath, which says, um, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Forever your word, this is Psalms 119.89, your word stands in heaven. The works of his hands and his judgment and all his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. And let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of God. 
For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. And one who turns away his ear from the law, even his prayer is an abomination. And then it shall come from one new moon to another new moon and from Sabbath to pa Sabbath that all mankind shall come to bow down before me. So the point is that we will forever worship God on the Sabbath day and the true Sabbath is on the seventh day. And this is becoming apparent to everyone, but I think we also need to keep in mind that the day on which it's done is important. So there's my summary. Thank you, Scott. Danielle, you're going to talk about a restless wanderer. Yes, I will. But before I get there, I was just thinking about what we were covering today, and it, the thought that came to me that it, God treated rest so importantly. He made us. He knows our intricate being and our needs and he did the entire creation and then what did he do immediately after that's how important it was it was like it's it's monumental so it's very good that we are spending an entire quarter on rest and there's so many aspects so it's exciting uh, it seems redundant you think rest and we're going to talk a quarter about rest well I think we're going to be quite amazed of the aspects of it all mm -hmm. but my lesson appointed for today on Thursday is a restless wanderer, and it's all about Cain, and somewhat about us, too. But let's, let's review a little bit about how this is all about Cain. So we know the, the, the story uh, in Genesis. I'm not going to read the entire part that is quoted in the lesson, but we'll talk a little bit about it and review some of, some of the texts in it. So we know that Cain and Abel were Adam and Eve's uh, two sons. And we know that uh, Abel was uh, a shepherd and Cain was a farmer. And uh, they were offered, the story begins where they're offering a sacrifice and uh, Abel is offering uh, uh, one of his sheep without blemish for a sacrifice. But Abel comes and offers gra a grain offering, uh, part of his grains. Now, because it was more convenient, right? Yes. So we, we're looking at this and, and we think, okay, at the first surface you think, hmm, is this so bad? Hmm. Hmm. God showed displeasure, and we'll analyze a little bit later why. So God basically said, in a way, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, and Cain was so upset that he ended up murdering his own brother over that. I mean, that's extreme, I think, <laughs> uh, by all standards. Uh, so obviously it was something that created so much animosity in his heart to the point where he did something so unthinkable. Mm -hmm. So what was the result of that? Let's look at Genesis chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. And God comes and, and says, and he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive, a fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. So obviously there is some consequences to his uh, murder, but he is not being killed. So it's not really an eye for an eye or mm, life for a life but there is a, a, a result of it. And uh, when I'm looking at this, we, if I were Cain, uh, what would I be thinking? The God of the universe just came to me and is telling me I've done an awful thing. I could repent. What did he say to the Lord? What was his response to the Lord? Genesis 4.13, and Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. What does that really mean? It means you're being unfair, God. That's really his position. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, do we reverberate a little bit with Satan's response to God? It's like, I should be equal and so on and so forth. It's sort of like the same attitude. There is definite, definitely no repentance. You're being unfair, God. Yeah, I killed, but so what? <laughs> you're being unfair. Um, now, why we will analyze a little bit why this is unacceptable. We know that uh, God had made provisions, as we learned through the entire Old Testament, for how sin, Adam and Eve's sin, 
was going to be uh, dealt with. And we know from reading from through the Old Testament, the institution of the offering, it had to be blood. So Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So they they were they knew what they were doing. God had made the institution of these offerings that they were giving. Um, but what was the issue with what Cain did? What it what made what was it that made Cain's offering unacceptable? Uh, he acknowledged in part is because he acknowledged in part but grudgingly the claim of God upon him, that God is in control. Um, but he had a spirit of rebellion that prompted him to meet the claims of God in a way of his own choosing, rather than to follow precisely the plan ordained by God. Ostensibly, he complied. But the manner of his compliance revealed his spirit. And before we quickly... Mm, wag our finger to, to Cain, in a way we do the same thing on a day-to-day -day basis. When we have instructions from the Lord on how we're supposed to do certain things in our life, and even on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Like even, that's a I was simple example. Bridge to the example of Cain in the sense that I think Cain basically did what the Christian world is doing. We're, we're going to exactly. worship you, God, but we're going to do it our, our way. Our way. That's Not, it. Kind of, kind of like the Sinatra song, I did it my, my way. way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's exactly the, the part of the issue with Cain. He really said, okay, I'm going to comply. I'm going to pretend I'm complying. I'm going to do an offering. God said that to do an offering. Well, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it my way like you said. So when we are disobeying the Lord and coming up with our own ways of doing things rather than following his instructions, on every level we are like Cain. And what happened to Cain is he became, because of his unrepented spirit, he became a restless wander, wanderer. Um, God did not kill him on the spot uh, because he had made provision for everyone and he had made provisions and given an opportunity for la later repentance. That's the amazing thing about God and his incredible love and patience with us and with Cain and with us every day. He, he made a provision for forgiveness at the later repentance. And because so many times we go on through our lives and it takes us years to repent. And, but what did Cain do? Genesis 4, 16, 17. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod of east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And really we don't have any other line about his life in the Bible. So really he just went on with his life. F future repentance never entered his mind. There was none of that. And he, because of that he really became a restless wanderer and we are the same when we do not repent and we do not obey the Lord and we do not follow his instructions. It's almost like there's a separation and we become anxious and restless wanderers. There's a difference. Um, we find a different example in the Bible when we look at David. And that's really what the Lord highlighted, and that's the example we need to follow. He turned to the Lord after he, after he sinned with Bathsheba and murdered his general, and he was told, you've done wrong in a similar manner by the prophet. He said in Psalm 51, verses 1 through 9, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions. Hmm? And my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, your desired truth is in the inward parts. Like in other words, it's my heart. It's in my heart. I want to do right. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, like cleanse me, and I shall be clean. 
Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot all my iniquities. When you read these words, you can't help but see, feel and his heart and his repentance. That's our example for us. Thank you. Do you have any mm -hmm. final thoughts? So I do have final thoughts. Um, I'm excited that we're looking at rest through this this uh, entire quarter, and I um, echoing from Dave's response is that the Lord is the only source for rest truly for us. And I'm looking forward to unpacking that through the entire quarter of how the Lord is our rest for us, because when we are running on empty and we are burned out with the burdens of life, only turning our eyes on him is the only option. Thank you. Scott, final, final, final thoughts. So, final thoughts. Uh, um, my thoughts are uh, essentially um, by following God's way, um, we could be at peace and at rest continuously. So uh, I, I'm reminded of the story of Jesus sleeping at, at the bottom of the boat when there's a storm going on. So I think because he was resting in God, and that, that's a rest that we can have not just on the Sabbath day, but on every day of the week, where we get to the state that we're resting in God, that nothing can upset our peace, nothing can take away that um, calmness. And, and I think that's what the Sabbath is for, to build up our relationship with God, our relationships with each other, to the point that they're so strong that nothing can disturb our peace. Good. So um, what I would like to say is that um, I, want, I want to talk about three practical lessons for us this week. So when we become too busy to rest in our Creator's loving care, our lives become filled with stress and anxiety. This stress can lead to physical illness and emotional distress. Secondly, our Creator has designed us to rest. The rest is more than a physical rest. As important as it is, this rest is a peace of mind which comes from believing His Word, trusting His promises, and entering into the blessedness of His Sabbath rest. And thirdly, living life apart from our Creator, as symbolized by Cain's experience, only frustrates our attempts to have inner peace and lasting joy. Rest comes from having a trusting relationship with the one who made us. Christ, in Christ there is rest. In his promises there is assurance. In, in, presence, in his presence we are free from anxiety, worry, and care. So I would like just to challenge us this week to take time to find rest in Christ. Take time to spend in his word. Take time to spend in prayer, talking with him, and see if that will not give you more peace than you have in your life today. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we're thankful that you gave us rest. We're thankful, Father, that you also gave, came and, and was an example on how we are to rest that peace in you, that time in the morning in prayer. As I think of those hours that you spend in the garden praying. And we can do that as well. As we lay our burdens on you, that peace of mind that comes from knowing that you're in charge, that you have control of this world, that there isn't a problem that you don't already have a resolution for. Lord, we need to make sure that we are putting that love and trust in your hands. So we ask that you would be with us this week. Help us to rest in you in ways that we haven't done before and that we may have un the unimaginable peace that only you can bring. Thank you for hearing our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. <laughs>